I like to keep things uh, short and simple and uh, very simplex. I want to tell you a secret of professional photography and if you'll bear with me while this video is seemingly boring I'm going to tell you something very quickly or at least as quickly as I can explain it to you that if you take it to heart and you practice it for one day it will improve your photography basically more than anything else now some of these are based upon others principles and some of them are based upon mine now let's talk about depth there are five aspects of depth three of which are lighting and the other two which are to do with the lens now SSD specular shadow and diffuse have to do with the lighting and we have perceptual depth and we have a potential rendered depth as I've talked about before as far as how our lens renders the depth of the scene now the perceptual depth of course as I mentioned before is micro contrast as far as what sort of intertonal transmission that you have obviously this is gear based the uh, perceptual depth and the potential depth <clears throat> let's assume you got a great lens well you have still got uh, three aspects of depth that need to be considered and uh, this is so incredibly important in professional photography and it really isn't considered by most people you need to know what sort of difference you want to split or what you want to raise now right now I just turned on uh, my light tint to illuminate this gold reflector. Of course, I have specular highlights still coming in from the window, but I have a lot more illumination, illumination over here in my shadows. So, SSD, specular, shadow, and diffuse are midtones, the parts that we want to expose for. Now, what, for example, would be the case, let me turn off my light tint, would be the case if I have too much difference in uh, stops between my shadows and uh, my specular highlights. You need to know what to expose for. What sort of composition are you trying to go for? Are you trying to uh, expose? Uh, you obviously never want to blow out your highlights. So do you want to uh, solve the situation? Because every photographic uh, composition is you translating what is between your ears and your imagination that you want to accomplish into the camera. Now once you can do that and make it subconscious then you can focus completely on composition and this is where photography excels because you're not constantly placing yourself trying to wonder what it is you need to expose for how to do it to get what is in your head onto the back of the camera now it is the case that every professional photographer in the world will take a few test shots and he'll get usually like a shotgun at distance you'll get about eighty percent there sometimes a lot more it depends on how familiar you are with the lighting situation but an easy way to approach this is is to know what it is you're exposing for and you have to be considering what sort of depth you want to render or the composition that you want based upon what it is you're exposing for your specular shadows and uh, your diffuse sections your diffuse value let the diffuse value if this were a portrait on a person's face would be the skin tones what sort of skin tones do you want to expose for what sort of speculars do you either want to expose for or actually bring because you either have to expose for it this is irrefutable you either have to say you've got no flash at all you either have to expose for it or you have to raise it what do I mean by raise it means that you need to add the illumination to give enough narrower dynamic range between your speculars and your shadows so that you don't blow your highlights if that's the composition that you want to go for if you want to expose for let me turn the light tent off again if you want to expose spot meter for these specular highlights coming in through the window and this gold tint this is identical to a person's face obviously nowhere near as reflective unless someone has an oily face of course you want to expose for that highlights what is that going to do as so far as dropping out your shadows now this of course is not taking into consideration what you obviously can do in post in Photoshop in Lightroom in capture one obviously so but you want to get as close as possible in the camera you need to understand how the camera works and be at least at the very first year or two in getting into or trying to get into professional photography a purist in that you want to capture as much as possible in the camera because the closer you get in camera the less you're going to have to screw with it in post and it makes things so much easier it quickens up the workflow it's like well I can I can underexpose it by a couple stops and then I'll screw with it later in Lightroom well that's great and fine and all but if you've got a paid gig you're going to be sitting in front of the computer with your hands glued to the keyboard all day long so 
What is it that you want to expose for? You need to be thinking about the scene, the composition, what it is you need to expose for, because your camera is an idiot. It wants to turn everything into gray sludge. If I let my camera make the decision on this shot, for example, where I have about uh, seven stops between my speculars and my shadows over here, then what's going to happen? Your camera wants to turn everything to gray sludge. It's going to cut the difference between these two. Does that always come out right? Well, sometimes it does, but often it doesn't. And usually, however, it is the case that it will not produce the results that you had in the composition in your mind. So you need to be thinking about SSD. Like I said, there are two things that are gear-based, which are perceptual depth and potential rendered depth, depending on how good the lens is in rendering actual depth, which is based upon binocular disparity in a lens that has too much glass. But that's gear-based. 70% uh, of what you're going to have to consider is not obviously on your camera. You bought your camera and you bought a really good lens with great micro contrast and great uh, rendered depth. Now your mission is to understand that your camera is an ignorant POS and that you're going to have to figure out how you want to either split the difference between the specular and the shadow. Are you going to expose uh, for your diffuse? Are you going to expose for your specular? Are you going to expose for your shadow? Well, you don't want to do that because you're going to blow the hell out of this. In a very, very few instances, that there are actually very few compositional... Some things are innate psychologically. And when it comes to photographs, when you blow the hell out of your highlights, there are a few exceptions where it's beautiful. And it works. It works great. Like, like using lens flare to your advantage. It ultimately, it really does comprise about 1 or 2% of photographs taken where you can actually blow the hell out of your highlights and go, that's exactly what I wanted, it is beautiful as is, and everyone else is going to agree with you. There are very few instances. So, being exposed for the shadows, what's that going to do if my range is too far between my shadows? What about for the diffuse? Um, diffuse, shadows, and specular. You need to be thinking about what you need to do. You're going to either have to split the difference, you're going to have to expose for one, or get extremely darn close and sit there in uh, post and Lightroom and raise your exposure slider or drop it down and then you're going to be messing with the workflow messing up your workflow because you thought you could just get close enough and shotgun it and know that you didn't blow out your highlights and you'll mess with it in post sometimes that's necessary if you don't have the time and it isn't a staged shot that you got to get what you can get and that is, of course is certainly the case but if you got landscapes you got uh, people I mean that stuff doesn't fly and it's going to show no matter what you do with it in post unless you have the abilities to you know really crank it in really dial it in but it's still it's just wasting time I and mean, you don't want to waste time you want to get it in the camera and the way you're going to get it in the camera is by understanding what it is you're exposing for so you're going to have to do one of two things you're going to either have to split whatever it is that you want to expose for if the dynamic range is too great between your speculars and your shadows or Secondly, and there's three things here, you're going to have to expose for the diffuse. Typically, you could spot meter uh, for your, uh, for your uh, highlights and expose uh, three or four stops, depending on the camera, depending on the ISO. And that way, you'll have a perfectly even diffuse midtone. Say this is a person's skin, which the gold is roughly, if this is black and gray, would be a person's skin. Or you're going to have to raise it. And what do I mean by raise it? It means you're going to have to bring the light. It means you're going to either have to split the difference or you're going to have to raise it. You're going to take the tonal values from your speculars and the, uh, the tonal values uh, from your shadows and you're going to have to bring the speculars and the shadows closer together so it makes exposure easier. And then of course you've got a lot of latitude. But what you've then done is you've created another problem. Now I've actually uh, dropped the dynamic range of this shot from my speculars, to, from my shadows, from here to here. And what that does is it creates flat pictures. And, you know, if you want a heavenly flat glow and use a Sigma art lens, which is famous for this, and also is famous in like my uh, 23 element uh, Tamron 70 to 200, you know, it makes beautiful, fast, super fast autofocus, and they're nice, nice sharp pictures, but they're flat. But here is an issue where you've got uh, a flat uh, composition in that I've actually raised my shadows so much closer uh, to my speculars that the image has no depth. So we're not talking about uh, perceptual depth, which is based upon the lens and micro contrast, and we're not talking about rendered depth which is based upon whether it's a low element prime lens or whether it's a, you know, I've got a 100 element zoom lens. 
but we're talking about separating out the actual uh, conceptual depth of how the image is rendered between the shadows, the diffuse, and the specular, because I brought these much closer together by raising it with my uh, light, whether that's a speed light, whether it is a light tint that I just turned off. You see I have a lot more depth here. Okay, what happens when I do this? I have a lot, a lot less depth. Do I have the same details? The same resolution in the shot? Well, yeah, I certainly do. But I've lost that depth that uh, people enjoy so much. I mean, it doesn't always have to be the case. But you've lost that depth by taking out the definition that shows you that this is a parabolic dish. This could be a person's face. It could be a child's toy. It could be anything. We're looking, obviously, an inanimate uh, parabolic reflector dish, but the same thing applies to anything you shoot, a car, a face, a body, a form, a line. You want as much depth as you can, unless that isn't what you're going for. If you want a grainy flat shot and the composition and your mind tells you that that's what you want to do, that's perfectly fine. Not everything has to be super, super deep. You don't actually have to either... Uh, uh, raise the light to give this depth that the sun was not coming through here and uh, it was just completely flat. This entire uh, entire parabolic dish were exactly like this side. This side and this side were perfectly the same. Then I would raise the light to give it depth. But if it needs to be flat compositionally and that's what you think it calls for, and that of course is a subjective choice, is a compositional choice depending on how you think and feel it needs to be rendered, it needs to be the case that your camera it becomes uh, you know, uh, the invisible tool between your imagination of what you see immediately or want to be seen uh, as captured on the back of uh, your uh, DSLR sensor, your camera needs to become an irrelevant tool because it is nothing other than an ignorant, stupid box, no matter how expensive it is. And the only thing your camera knows how to do is to take this plus this, add them together, and go <laughs> make a nice, even exposure between the two. And like I said, a lot of times that works, but usually it sure as hell turns out flat and boring and is not what you want. And uh, when your camera decides to do that, when all cameras do this, okay, unless you're spot metering or center, uh, center weight metering, your camera wants to mash this into this, it wants to mash your beans into your jello. It's like your camera is a blender of light. I mean, that exactly is, is what your camera should be called. Every camera, no matter how cheap or how expensive, is like you take your peas and your mashed potatoes and your steak. It's like an old person that's got to be fed through a tube and you stick it all into a blender and, bzzz, and then it, it spits out something that looks like baby food. Every camera should be called a baby food machine because it wants to trash every picture that you take and just plop out some baby food. And you need to not let that happen. This is what is keeping your uh, pictures from getting better. You have to understand the specular, the shadow, and the diffuse. And you have to understand what the hell it is you're exposing for. And after you do that, and it's okay to fail for a week. It's okay to fail for a month doing that. But you need to start spot metering. It's like, well, I don't like spot metering. I'm not, I don't give a damn. If you want to progress, you know, you're not going to achieve anything by doing the same damn thing you did before. You're going to have to start doing something different. And the way your mind's going to work um, is you're going to have to start spot metering and going out and failing. You know, if it's an important shoot and you need to you know, stick it in uh, aperture priority and whatever you want, let the camera meter. That's fine, that's understandable, but you're going to have to start failing and seeing what it is you're exposing for and what sort of effects that have. Because when I look at this shot, I know that I want it to have a certain depth, so I'm going to spot meter for right here, and my highlights won't be blown out. I'll have uh, detail in my shadow. I'll keep the resolution, but I'll have the definition by using properly my brain, not the camera, to know what it is I'm exposing for, whether I'm going to split the difference between the shadows and the specular, I'm going to expose for the diffuse without blowing out my highlights. You're only dealing with three things ultimately here. The other two things are gear-based. Once you've got the gear, you don't have to think about that. So the three things you're going to have to be thinking about, shadow, specular, and diffuse. And that's going to give you the depth. Not only the depth, but the correct exposure for what it is you are trying to do. But you have to translate that immediately from your brain to the shots without constantly fighting your camera. If you're fighting your camera, then you're making the mistake. Once your camera has been, uh, you know, 
beat like a dog into submission and then it's on a chain and it's totally obedient to you then that is when photography blooms and it becomes so much more fun because you can immediately take what is between your ears and put it on the back of the sensor and then onto the card and that makes you happy and the client happy and everybody anyway thanks for watching and catch you later